Hey guys, got a new battery in for review here today. This is a 48 volt, 105 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from Vatrer. This battery is designed primarily for use in golf carts or other mobile applications. Now I don't have a golf cart, uh, but they sent this out to me anyway. So we're going to run through the usual review process, but it may lean a bit towards the solar application. Now this is actually a kit. It came with a very nice 20 amp AC charger and a little remote display panel. First things first, let's take a look at the specifications. This battery is rated for a 200 amp continuous discharge current, a 400 amp discharge for up to 35 seconds, and a 600 amp discharge for up to three seconds. That'll play a key role in its ability to function in a golf cart where you need that uh, instantaneous, that inrush current, that high inrush current to get your vehicle from the stopped position into motion. This battery measures 20 inches long, 13 inches deep, 10 inches high, and it weighs in at 103 pounds. This battery is built in a heavy duty steel enclosure, probably one of the most heavy dutiest I've seen. Is that even a word, heavy dutiest? Uh, probably one of the toughest I've seen thus far in the batteries I've reviewed. I've got a few specifications on the top here, 51.2 volts, 105 amp hours, uh, 5,376 watt hours. There are a few warnings. One of particular interest, it says, if leaving five days or longer, the pack must be shut off. Uh, so I don't know if it's just a BMS they're concerned with draining the battery or if there are other electronics on the inside. Uh, the cover is held on with a series of Phillips screws the whole way around the lid. We have our main positive and our main negative terminals. These are the standard M8 bolts we've seen on many of these batteries. We have an on off switch here. We have a Bluetooth. Okay, that's just the Bluetooth antenna. Uh, so that is interesting to see. I guess they assume the Bluetooth module being inside the steel enclosure uh, would be better to have the antenna on the outside. And I actually like to see that. We have an RS-485 port, the connector that's commonly referred to as an aviation connector. Uh, then we have a pressure relief vent here. There's not too much else to see on the outside here. We do have some mounting feet affixed to the bottom of the case there with some slots for screws. So taking a look at the remote display here, it does mount at what appears to be a 60 degree or so angle. Uh, and there is a four pin connector here on the end. And they give you a nice lengthy cable. Looks like it may be about 10 feet or so. So we'll simply connect these two together. And you see it's got some rubber there. So it is forming a moisture resistant seal, which is nice to see. And then this end obviously will thread into the battery. Let's see if we can turn it on with this display. So it is at 0%. I've already run the capacity test. So we've got a number of pages here. What's on page two? Oh, so page two has actual controls. We have discharging on and charging on. Can we touch those? Can we shut those off? We can, look at that. So interestingly, when I pressed the discharge button, I did hear something click inside. And uh, I don't think that's a relay. I have to wonder if there's like a contactor or something in there. Uh, so we can see our lowest cell is in blue, 3.146 volts, and our highest cell is in green, 3.169 volts. Next we have their charger, and just by picking it up and looking at it, it appears to be a very heavy duty charger. This is a uh, very thick cable here, and this is the DC output side. Uh, you can see it's got two pins there, and it appears to be a twist lock of some sort uh, connector. And then they gave us this little jumper here, which I guess would be the, uh, the male end of the twist lock connector with a pair of ring terminals. And it's kind of funny how thick this cable is just to have these two what appear to be maybe number 10 or number 12 gauge conductors here. But that, that cable is very thick just to hold. So I don't know if that's all insulation in there, if it's shielded or what the deal is. Nice. There's one thing I don't like about this and that's that it's not immediately clear which one is the positive and the negative. We have a brown and a blue. Now they are labeled battery plus and battery minus, but but it is convention to have the positive red and the negative black. At least it is here in the United States. Uh, this color scheme perhaps is more common somewhere else in the world or a different application. On the back here, we have a little bit of information about the charger. We can see it's 58.4 volts, 20 amps. Input is 100 to 240 volts, 50 or 60 hertz. So this will work pretty much anywhere with any power source, it sounds like. Interestingly, it says the output plug, red is positive and black is negative, but that does not match the colors on the actual plug, so. Now this does have a 16 amp connector here. You can see it looks a little bit different from the standard, you know, desktop computer type power supply. 
And we have the female side of that here and we could see it is indeed rated for 16 amps at 250 volts. This cable contains 14 gauge conductors and it does have a standard plug for a 15 amp receptacle here in the United States. Taking a look at the datasheet specifications here, we can see it is rated for 13 amps input current. Technically, you are exceeding the rating of a 15 amp circuit because a continuous load defined as three hours or more needs to be derated 80%. So if you are using this charger, I personally would plug it into a dedicated 20 amp circuit with a 20 amp receptacle. That's just my preference for a bit of added safety there. We also got a large quantity of screws and I'm not sure why this many screws came with this battery. Um, I do see there are a few different lengths, but some of them are, a large majority of them are the same length. We have a couple of terminal covers if you need to disconnect your battery and uh, you know transport it for added safety. And then we have some very large and very nice terminal covers designed to put your cable and your lug through it. And then this will go over your terminal to protect both the lug and the terminal from any uh, accidental shorting or unwanted electrical contact. I really like these plugs. You simply press it and it locks into place. And then when you're done, simply twist the button and you can disconnect it. It's very, very easy. Okay, so that's connected. Going to plug in the AC power here. Got a click in the, oh, got a click in the battery as well. And it does appear to be charging. We're putting about 16 amps, it was 20 amps, 21 amps into the battery but uh, the power switch is off. So I guess that power switch is only for discharging. Let's go ahead and turn it on. So now we have another click in the battery and we're still seeing the same current. It's around 21 to 22 amps. Uh, so that's a bit odd. I guess this power switch is only for discharging. Uh, so it's important to note that this switch, I guess, is not going to be used for isolation purposes. If you need to isolate this battery, uh, you have to actually disconnect it physically. We're still charging around 22 amps. We'll leave this run until the charger is completed. All right, so the battery does appear to be done charging. The clamp meter is showing zero amps. And we have a green light on the side of the charger. All right, so we have the capacity testing setup connected here. It's the standard setup I've used in all of my tests. We've got a Batrium shunt there and a Batrium BMS as the metering device. Our tablet is showing Voltage, amperage, wattage, discharged amp hours, and discharged watt hours. Our test load is a 48 volt reliable electric inverter, 1500 watts. It's going to a battery charger, charging a separate battery bank so as not to waste this power. It also makes a perfect load for capacity testing. The resting voltage is around 54.1 volts, a little bit lower than I would have expected, but we'll see what it tests out at. And we're discharging at approximately 1.35 kilowatts or 25 amps at the current voltage. All right, the BMS has shut down our test and we came in at 105.49 amp hours. That is a perfect capacity test. All right, let's go ahead and take these screws out and see if we can pull the lid. That looks very clean. Oh, those aren't bus bars. That's a strip with the balance leads on it, I see. I was so amazed by the batteries, I didn't even realize the nice gasket seal they have the whole way around this to keep moisture out. Uh, we see our 16 cells. There's eight across the top, eight across the bottom here. And we can see the bus bars are aluminum. They are uh, laser welded to the terminals and they had the hump in the middle to allow for expansion if the cells were to expand and contract. They've then laid this mat thing. It's a flexible mat thing across the top of the battery pack. And we can see each location here where a balance lead has been spot welded to the bus bar. So there's one there, one there, you know, another one here and so forth. Additionally, we have, it says B1 slash T1. So I assume that is a temperature sensor. We have temperature sensor four over here, but I don't see any other ones. So that would imply there are uh, two more here somewhere, perhaps down in the battery itself. Uh, so this mesh stuff comes back to this connector here for the balance leads. And uh, the wires and temperature sensors are all numbered here. The same up here for the second set of batteries. Our interconnect between the two packs here is a solid, probably a solid piece of, uh, you know, it looks like the standard uh, nickel alloy type copper. Um, I don't think it's aluminum, but it's really hard to tell without taking it out. The same with the main bus bars down here. This is not flexible material. This is a solid bus bar, uh, but it is bent to fit the chassis here. This looks so nice in here. I really hate to take this thing apart, but uh, we need to gather some more information.
All right, so before we take this apart, I do want to test the low temperature charging protection. Uh, so I've got my little display here connected and I've got my charger going back here. Uh, and by the way, there is definitely a contactor down in there. So I've not seen a battery like this with a contactor before. That's pretty cool. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in and then we're gonna hit one of those temperature sensors with this can of compressed air that usually triggers the low temperature charge protection pretty quickly. Uh, and we'll just make sure it shuts off here. All right, so listen to that contactor when I plug this battery in. So we are putting 5.6 amps in currently. Just gonna go ahead and spray this sensor right here. Nope, it didn't like that. It definitely shut off. Uh, and there you can see the temperature. It shows 19 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's climbing back up here. We should see it turn back on when it hits approximately 32 degrees or a freezing point. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Are you going to turn back on? No. Do I need to press the power button? So I think the protection turned off, but I think the charger shut off because it thinks it's done. So let's try that unplug. Did I break it? Let's see. Well, it shows discharging off and it says it's normal. I really hope I didn't break something already here. Let's unplug. Right, let's disconnect the charger completely because there's now an orange or a red light flashing on it. All right, so the light's off on the charger. We'll plug back into the battery and we will plug back into the power. Okay, and it started charging again. So for some reason that charger just needed to reset. Let's try that one more time here. Spray. Okay, it did trigger a fault. So page two here shows status. It says cut and it won't let us turn it back on because of the low temperature. Okay, there it goes. It turned back on, but that charger remains in the off state uh, until you power cycle the charger. So that is an odd quirk. That's not the battery. That is the charger doing that. Um, or it does say off here, turn it on. Oh, and there it goes. So that, that is a bit unusual. I'm not sure what happened the first time, but uh, just cycling it here, just like that, uh, brought it back on again. So there we go. Let's go ahead and disconnect the high uh, side balance lead first, and then the low number cells. I'm then going to remove this uh, cross connect here just to reduce the overall voltage in this battery pack in half so it's less, less of a shock hazard. Now I can go ahead and remove the main positive and the main negative connections here. And there is one connection here for the RS485. So this is indeed a JBD BMS and there you can see it says 7 to 21 S. We have all of our balance leads coming in off of both of these connectors here. That connector doesn't look very good there. Um, I don't think that was my damage either considering how these cables are bundled. Uh, it's putting stress on that connection point. And yeah, those are some of the balance leads so I don't like to see that now. Again, I don't think I caused that considering when you hold this cable in the orientation it was sitting in the box, this is what it looks like. Um, I think just because of the way they're so tight, it kind of pulled on that connector there a little bit. So that's, that's definitely something I think they need to address. Look at that contactor in here. This is the contactor. So you can see the main negative comes down here. There's a large copper bus bar going across to this terminal. Then there's a large copper bus bar going down to the contactor where it then exits the contactor and goes up to the negative terminal of the battery. So here's a side. Side, you can see the contactor. This is gonna be the control for that contactor. Uh, this contactor is using power from the battery and while it may just be a few milliamps, you know, I'd, I'd guess 50 to 100 milliamps or so, uh, it's, it's still going to deplete that battery over time. So yes, I fully agree now that I'm seeing how this is designed, if you're going to leave this sit, uh, to make sure it is powered off when not in use. All right, so there's the underside of that plate. We have our Bluetooth module. It's a standard JBD Bluetooth module. They simply attached this external antenna uh, that protruded out the front of the case. We can see there is a thermal pad on both above and below the contactor. The other one is uh, squashed under there. You can see it from the side. Uh, we also have a very large 20, 20 watt, I guess that's 10 ohm, a 20 watt, 10 ohm resistor, which I can't imagine what that's actually for. Uh, perhaps that's providing step down power for this contactor, but 
Uh, and maybe it, maybe it is, given I see there's a thick negative cable. Where's that one going? The output of the con... Oh, that's the... Yeah, that's the output of the contactor. So, uh, but anyway, the BMS is fairly small compared to what we usually see, simply because all of the FET uh, controlling, the, the transistor controlling, is moved over to this contactor. So all we're left with on the BMS is a control circuit, a computer, and then our series of resistors used for balancing this. There's not much else to see on this BMS, but something else I'm taking note of as I'm talking is this is actually a shunt. This is a shunt. So if we look on the side here, you can make out, it says 500 amp, 35 millivolt. So this is a shunt bar that's screwed across these two terminal points. Yeah, my only complaint really is this connector. I think this connector radius, this cable bend radius here needs to be fixed. It just needs like an extra half an inch or so of leads there for the BMS. But one other thing too is I'm not seeing the other two temperature sensors. I see on this board here, there are four leads coming in, a positive and negative from both sensor, and they are labeled NTC1 and NTC2. Uh, so perhaps there are, other, there are other sensors on this board somewhere, maybe on the other side, I'm not sure. But as far as I can tell, there are only two placed on the battery which are coming in through these four leads. So these battery packs are held in by these long threaded bolts here, which then bolt into the bottom of the chassis. You can see bolt holes there and there. Uh, there's a protective epoxy board at the bottom. So here we have eight 105 amp hour cells. They're held together with these steel bands. There's a nice thick plate on each end of it. This is probably aluminum if I had to guess. And there is some sort of material between them. It looks to be a gray foam of some sort. Here's another look at the side of the battery with that thick aluminum plate. Uh, I'm going to guess they're EVE cells. Uh, there is a QR code under here. And it does start with 02Y, so I do believe these are EVE brand cells. It doesn't appear to be uh, scratched off or anything like that. It is white though. I'm not sure why it is white but it feels laser engraved and it feels to be the original code as far as I can tell based on looking at it here. That's where we're gonna call it quits here. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, after I reassembled most of this battery here, it's pretty clear that those balance leads on that one pack just need to be a little bit longer. Uh, Vatrer has done an absolute outstanding job designing the rest of this battery pack. I love the way they built this bus bar mat here that you simply lay over a pack do your laser welds, do your spot welds, and you're done. I also like seeing the rigid solid bus bars as opposed to uh, crimped cables that are of questionable size. They've gone through great lengths to make this absolutely perfect. All they need to do is make those balance leads a little bit longer and I'll be, I'll be satisfied myself. Um, that's about the only thing I have in terms of feedback. Otherwise, I think this will do great in a golf cart or a mobile application, especially with that contactor. I'll leave links to where you can purchase this battery or find out more information. Uh, by the way, we are getting close to Black Friday and if you haven't checked out the battery finder tool yet, I highly recommend you do so. It's listing all of the batteries on Amazon that I could find, at least the script could find, their current price, and it updates the price hourly. It includes shipping calculations, and it includes uh, lightning deal discounts. Any questions or comments, you can leave those. Hit that like button before you go, and thanks for watching.